time, um, you know, um, basically hopefully stimulate some discussion around uh, conduction system pacing and, and what the best way to do it is. Uh, my name is not Santosh Padala. Uh, so Santosh is actually the uh, gentleman who trained me in left bundle pacing when I went down to Ken Ellenbogen's lab and to watch cases. And then he came up to South Lake to proctor us on our first few cases. And as uh, Jackie has pointed out, it's been uh, full steam ahead since then, and we have uh, we have a publication coming out in Jackie P on uh, left bundle pacing. So um, you know, basically, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about why conduction system pacing. I'm not going to spend too much time on that and his bundle pacing because I think most of you are already familiar with the concept and why we would want to do it. The real question is, you know, why left bundle branch area pacing and, uh, you know, more importantly, what the technique is for doing it. So, uh, you know, I think we all know that RV apical pacing is not the ideal way to do things. I mean, look, it's fast, it's easy. We've been doing it for um, many decades. So, you know, but I think clearly evidence has suggested that RV pacing by changing the RV activation sequence may lead to worsening outcomes, uh, particularly in patients with mildly impaired ejection fractions. And so I think, uh, you know, that's really where the concept of conduction system pacing came in. Now, for those of you who are younger on the call, uh, you may not know this, but um, conduction system pacing has actually been around for a long time. When I was doing my training at the Cleveland Clinic uh, in 2005, um, they were very interested in his bundle pacing and we were doing cases at that time. Then people kind of lost interest in it and uh, people said, well, maybe this is not the best way to do things. And then like anything old, uh, it comes back again and now suddenly it's in vogue again. And so there have been ups and downs in this history. Um, but right from the very beginning, there was a feeling that if you could pace directly into the Hiss bundle, assuming that you did not have distal conduction system disease, then you would be able to get a ventricular activation sequence that is basically very, very physiologic. And the surrogate for showing this would be uh, a completely narrow QRS or at least a QRS duration that is similar to that in sinus rhythm for these patients on ECG. So uh, just to remind you a little bit about the anatomy, um, basically uh, the idea is that you try and locate exactly where this his bundle is, and then you try and screw a lead into this his bundle area, which would then allow the electrical impulse delivered by the lead to go through the natural conduction system and therefore activate the ventricles in a normal way. <clears throat> However, it's important to remember that the His bundle region is actually buried in a very fibrotic region. And this is important because, uh, sorry, a fiber bound, I shouldn't say fibrotic, fiber bound region. And this is very important because when you're trying to screw a lead into this his bundle, you really have to get through that fibrous tissue in order to penetrate that bundle of his and get appropriate pacing. And sometimes it can be very difficult. I apologize that I'm sort of skipping through that, but you don't need all of those anatomical uh, lectures. But sometimes you really have to get 
deep into that fibrous brown bound area in order to really get into that AV nodal or sorry his bundle region and this can present certain problems for current technologies and current leads because first of all most of our current leads are only designed to be active fixation leads with very small uh, screws that basically can only penetrate a short distance in and then even if you can get a lead to screw deeper in as you can with some of the for example the Medtronic 3830 lead which is uh, you know a lead that has a tine on the end of it it's only for French and you're able to screw it and penetrate it you may not be able to get ideal pacing thresholds and furthermore you may be limited by sensing of the R wave when you screw it into that His bundle region. So one of the reasons why His bundle pacing has never really taken off in the way that you would imagine it is the fact that first of all, it does take a little bit more time and effort. Although frankly, uh, a lot of you are, uh, you know, electrophysiologists who can find the His bundle fairly easily. So usually finding the His isn't such a big deal. But the bigger deal is even if you find the hiss and screw the lead in exactly the right place, the sensing of the R wave may not be ideal. The pacing threshold may not be ideal. And even worse, as time goes on, those pacing thresholds can get worse over time to the point where the lead can actually fail in longer term follow up. And so many centers that are practicing his bundle pacing will even put in a backup RV lead because they're concerned that the his bundle lead may fail at some point in the future and the patient should have a backup RV lead just in case. So, um, you know, obviously the his bundle is associated with some disadvantages. So in contrast to his bundle pacing, um, we have the concept of left bundle area pacing. And the idea behind left bundle area pacing is that it may be able to get past some of the innate disadvantages that his bundle pacing has. For the time being, the tools that we use for left bundle area pacing are actually very, very similar to the tools that you would use for his bundle pacing. So you would still use sheaths, for example, which although they are designed to deliver your lead specifically to the his bundle region, they can be altered in shape, especially if you put a stiff guide wire into them, such that they can deliver your lead into the left bundle region rather than the his bundle region. You would still use the same lead, which for the time being anyway, is predominantly the Medtronic Select Secure 3830 pacing lead, which as I pointed out is about a four French lead, with an exposed helix that is capable of being screwed as a whole deep into the tissue. But there are other leads that are being developed by other companies that may be able to, in one day, satisfy this purpose. <clears throat> and now we even have deflectible sheets which have that distal posterior tilt where they can certainly be deflected in order to get you to a classic his position, but by un taking out some of the deflection, you may be able to shape the sheath in such a way that it can get you to that left bundle region. And so if you look at this uh, schematic of the conduction system, you can see here that this is the position where you would normally put the lead if you were doing his bundle pacing. But in contrast to his bundle pacing where there's a very narrow targeted area that you have to get into, 
left bundle area pacing can really be done along a wide spectrum of the right ventricular septum because of the fact that the left bundle extends down the length of that septum, has many branches down that septum, and therefore can be entrained at several different points along the septum by your lead. So that is clearly one of the big advantages of using left bundle area pacing is that it is technically a much larger target area and you may have higher success rates down the road. So uh, let me just skip over some of these slides because they really focus on his bundle pacing and that's not the topic that we really want to talk about here. But I just wanted to show you some of the potential long-term disadvantages that may be associated with classic Hintz bundle pacing. So remember I was talking about pacing thresholds that can be quite high. Well, they can occur in approximately one in three patients in whom you put a Hiss bundle pacing lead. Many of these patients, if they get a backup lead, will end up being having either apical or septal pacing on ECG at follow-up. About 10% of the patients may end up having that His bundle lead deactivated. And even if they don't have that His bundle lead deactivated because of the higher pacing thresholds, the median EOL for the pacemakers are only about five or six years, which are obviously a lot shorter than what you would normally expect from a pacemaker. And this is all based on a median follow-up of about 3.3 years. So left bundle area pacing is essentially where instead of going along the His bundle, you move further down or more distal to the His bundle onto the septum of the right ventricle. And you basically screw the pacing lead into the septum of the right ventricle in order to penetrate into the left bundle branch area. So how do you do this? Well, my first tip to anyone who's starting to do this is get in the habit of first locating the Hiss. So even though you're not gonna screw your lead into the Hiss bundle, at least put your lead in that region record a Hiss recording, and then save that as a reference picture so that at least you have a sense of where you should be mapping. And then in general, what you should do is then advance your sheath 1.5 to two centimeters distal to where you have marked the Hiss, and that is ideally the place where you are going to start to screw your lead in. Now, once you get more in the habit of left bundle area pacing, you may not need to map the Hiss initially, but for the first several cases, I did that, and it was very, very useful for me to get to understand the anatomy of the septum and to understand where it was that I needed to go. And you may ask, well, how do you shape your sheath to move away from the Hiss and go further down on the septum? So if you're using the deflectable sheath, one of the ways that you can do it is simply take out some of the deflection and allow the sheath to fall lower on the septum. But actually, I, interestingly enough, still continue to use the non-deflectable sheath because at the time that I learned, there was only a non-deflectable sheath. And so uh, once you get trained how to use something, you tend to stick with it. And I would use a very stiff Amplatzer guide wire to put through the sheath. And what that does is it kind of stretches out the curve of that his sheath and as it turns out, when it stretches out that curve, the non-deflectable sheath becomes ideally shaped 
to actually guide you to the right place on the septum. Then what you do is you start to screw in your lead into the septum and you're going to look for some very specific 12 lead patterns that tell you whether you're in the right region or not. And I'll talk a little bit about how you need to look for a so-called W pattern in V1, as well as discordance in the initial portion of AVR and AVL. And if you start to see those initial signs with pacing, then this is probably a reasonable place to try and screw into. And at that point, you would rotate your lead at least once. And so this is just an example of the type of morphology that you may get initially with pacing. So first and foremost, I want you to see how these 12 leads are arranged. And this is what we do in our clinical lab. So we put V1 down at the bottom and we usually color it a different color because V1 is where you're looking for that classic notched or W pattern. And then you also want to see discordance in AVR and AVL. So we'll usually color those two leads a different color so that they stand out from the rest. And when you're initially screwing in and pacing and testing the lead, these are really the three leads you need to focus on. And you don't necessarily need to try and interpret all 12 leads at the same time. So you can see here that this individual, in this case Santosh, has obviously started to screw the lead in. You can see that he is starting to see a bit of a notched pattern in V1, although I'll show you a more classic example of this. And you can clearly see discordance in AVR and AVL. Now sometimes if the patient has underlying conduction system disease, you may not see as much discordance here as you perhaps would like to see. But that's why I always focus on the first 50 milliseconds or so of the QRS. That, those are really the parts of the QRS that need to be discordant. The rest of the QRS may not necessarily be discordant depending on intraventricular conduction delay. So in terms of where you want to be on the septum, the His bundle would usually be high here, higher up on the septum, but you really want to be about 1.5 to 2 centimeters more distal on the septum. That's really the position where you want to be. Now, generally, we always do these procedures in about 10 degrees of RAO because that will really open up the septum for you and allow you to see more clearly how far you are away from the His. So the RAO 10 view is usually the first view that you will use. Now, once you have gotten to a place where you think it is a reasonable position on the septum, and when you start pacing there, you start to see some signs that this is a good sign. The next step is really for you to start to screw the lead into the septum. And there is a very specific technique on how you do this. So first of all, don't just start screwing the lead from the distal tip of the lead and screwing it in 40, 50, 60 times. That's not going to work. You need to use a two-handed technique to screw the lead along the body of the lead and very close to where the lead is entering the sheath. Because it's only by using this two-handed technique that you're going to be able to translate your torque to the tip of the lead. And so, if necessary, you may need to have an assistant who will hold the sheath in position for you on the septum while you take the time to screw that lead using a two-handed technique. Um, generally speaking, when you are completed, your lead will often be about 
1.8 to 2 centimeters within the right ventricular septum. And I'm just showing this to you here because you might ask yourself, well, how deep do I know my lead is in the septum? And the answer is you can use the landmarks on the lead to make your measurements. So from the tip of the distal helix, to the proximal end of the proximal electrode is actually exactly 1.8 centimeters. And most of the time, this entire portion of the lead, all 1.8 centimeters of it, will be buried into the septum in your final result. So as I said, when you first start pacing, you want to see this classic W notched pattern. And this is a beautiful example of this in V1. And if you look up at AVR and AVL, you'll see that at least the initial portion of AVR and the initial portion of AVL are dissociated from one another. Now, if you look more distally in the QRS, you may not be convinced that AVR and AVL are dissociated, but that's why I say you really need to focus on the initial portions of AVL and AVR. Once you have arrived at this pattern, you will start to screw the lead maybe once or twice at the most into the septum. And then you will ask the pacing nurse or pacing tech to start pacing again. And what you'll notice is that this notch, which initially will start in the proximal portion of the Q, uh, local electrogram at V1, will start to move more distally into the QRS. So the notch here is early, then it starts to get later. And as the notch is getting later, you'll also start to notice that your QRS is starting to look narrower. So once you see this, you'll be encouraged. So then you stop pacing and you screw in the lead maybe once or twice more. And then if you're lucky with only about four or five turns of the lead, you'll get to a morphology that looks like this, the so-called QR pattern, or you may have a little blip here, in which case you have an RSR prime pattern. You'll also notice that your QRS becomes substantially narrower at this point, as you can see visually. And you'll also notice that there is now some latency between your pacing spike and when the QRS starts. And usually that latency is about 30 to 40 milliseconds. And when you see that notch turn into a QR pattern, then you know you are probably in the correct place and you do not need to screw that lead anymore. And this is just a septogram that is being performed in the LAO view. So we are injecting some contrast through the end of the sheath to visualize the septum. And you can see that this lead is quite deep in the septum. In fact, this is not even as deep as it usually is. Oftentimes the entire proximal electrode is buried in the septum. But in this case, you can see that there is probably at least 1.1 or 1.2 centimeters of the lead that is buried in the septum. Now, I cannot emphasize enough the two-handed technique for screwing the lead. And in order to screw that lead properly using the two-handed technique, you need clean gloves. And this sounds like a ridiculous thing to say. And when Santosh first told this to me, I thought, man, you're an anal guy, like, you know, who has clean gloves? but he was totally correct. Either wash your hands with your gloves or just get a new pair of gloves so that you have brand spanking clean fingers when you're doing this technique and watch how he is screwing this lead. It is a two-handed technique. Both fingers are very close to where that lead enters into the sheath. Notice he's not screwing the lead from the distal tip. He is screwing it very much here at the hub of the sheath. And he's using both hands to make sure he translates that torque to the very tip of the lead. 
Very, very important. Now, sometimes you will get into a very fibrotic septum and you'll notice that as you're trying to screw this lead in, it might buckle or it might even backspin on you. And that means that maybe the site where you're trying to screw is full of fibrotic tissue and that might indicate to you that you may need to go to another position on the septum, usually more distal, to try and find a more ideal implant site. And if that site also gives you problem, you may need to go even more distal than that. Now, if it turns out that you go into a site and you can't advance the lead or your pacing morphology is not ideal, you can certainly unscrew the lead and take it out, but this is what you'll often find. You'll find you have a tissue core biopsy on the end of your lead. So you have to clean your lead before you can use it again. And my advice is the easiest way to clean it is to take your scalpel and basically do gentle strokes with the scalpel through this tissue and that tissue will come out of the helix of the lead. So the scalpel is probably the best way to get rid of this extra tissue. And this is just an example of a left bundle lead that is buckling instead of screwing into the septum. Usually if it screws into the septum, it just goes like butter into the septum and you will see it clearly advancing on fluoroscopy. But here you can see that the lead is not advancing. If anything, it's doing this weird dancing maneuver. And this is an example of a lead that clearly is not screwing into the septum. Now, I saw that Jackie was already talking to you a little bit about LVATs, and that is one of the criteria for left bundle pacing. So usually we measure this in V5 from the spike to the peak of the R wave of the QRS. And you can see here that at high voltage, because we are at high voltage, we are in the conduction system. And so the total LVATS conduction time is very short. It's only 65 milliseconds. But when we go to low voltage pacing, we are no longer capturing the left bundle system and we are now capturing more of the local myocardium and suddenly your LVATS balloons out to 93 milliseconds. So clearly in this case, we have not fully engaged or selectively paced the left bundle. But if we screw the lead maybe one or two more times, now you can see that with high voltage output pacing, we have a short LVATS time. And even when we go to low voltage output pacing, we still have that short LVATS time. So that's ideally what you wanna see as you go from high voltage pacing to low voltage pacing. All right, I am going to, I'm, I'm being cognizant of the time and I've already probably taken up way too much of your time tonight. So I'm just gonna end off on this slide to say that ideally the criteria for left bundle capture is that you should have that classic paste morphology with that QR pattern or RSR prime pattern in V1. The second criteria might be identification of the left bundle potential, but I will tell you right now that we only see the left bundle potential in fewer than 25% of cases. So if you're waiting to see a left bundle potential, you'll be waiting a long time. You won't see it in every single case. The one criteria that we really rely on is that LVATS time, the stim to LVAT, that is a very important uh, criterion. Uh, evidence of direct left bundle branch capture, um, which usually can be hard to determine if you don't see a left bundle potential. And then finally, determination of selective and non-selective left bundle branch pacing, where you look at that uh, latencies uh, that I was talking about between the STEM artifact and the QRS. 
So Jackie, uh, I'm, I'm going to stop there because uh, I don't want to take up uh, all of your time. And I know you wanted to discuss some actual case uh, examples, which probably better uh, explain this than, than I could. Uh, but hopefully, um, you know, I didn't take too much of your time. No, th thanks, Atul. I think that was fantastic. Um, very nice kind of overview. Um, I'm just going to share my screen then. Uh, here we go. So I'm kind of bringing it back to your last slide. You know, how can you consider um, uh, your pacing lead to be in the right spot? And I'm just going to elaborate maybe for the next five minutes on, on that, you know, kind of how do you know when to stop? And so I just still wanted to talk about the left bundle potential because the fellows always tell me that I'm, I'm totally making up this left bundle branch potential, but I, I do believe that you can see it in, in, in some patients. Um, and one of the reasons why you can see it in some patients versus others is maybe because, you know, it might be very subtle. So you might have to, for example, here, this left bundle branch potential, you had to really gain up to be able to see it. Here, you can see that it's within the actual ventricular um, uh, uh, beat. So, you know, you have to kind of uh, pretend that it's there. But either way, wherever you see the left bundle branch potential, it always occurs prior to the onset of the QRS. So that's how you kind of know that it's, it's there. <clears throat> So in some studies, they see it, they say they see it in up to 40 to 50% of um, cases, but you know, it's true, you really have to start to look for it. And it's really essential that you, find it, that, that you do see it because it suggests that you are in the subendocardial layer and that you should really stop because there's a high chance of perforation if you keep going. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about this program, Deep Septal Stimulation, another kind of way to figure out if you're at the sweet spot. And um, in the majority of left bundle um, branch pacing cases, there's a non-selective left bundle branch capture. So you're capturing both the left bundle branch and the local septal myocardium. And so in order to differentiate the two, um, we can exploit the, the effective refractory period between the myocardium and the left bundle. And so, uh, the goal really is to confirm left bundle branch capture by visualizing at least one of the two components of this PACE QRS complex, which is the non-selective. So the non-selective is divided into myocardial only PACE QRS, which we can kind of see down here. It's a little bit more slurred, a little bit wider looking, um, and a selective paced left bundle branch QRS, which as you were talking about earlier, there's a latent period here, 20 to 30 milliseconds approximately, and then uh, usually a beautiful right bundle branch look um, and, and sharper kind of look. So the deep septal stimulation um, <clears throat> is performed um, when, you've, when you think that you've reached the final lead position. Um, you set the pacing output to two times the capture threshold. Obviously this is all unipolar pacing. And you set your paper speed to 50 to 100. And then you have an eight beat drivetrain of 600, and then you give a premature stimulus, an S2, usually at about 400 to 450 milliseconds. Sometimes you have to go higher if the, um, if the right ventricle is a little bit more dilated or uh, you have uh, conduction delays. So as long as um, the premature stimulus is uh, not identical, then you have to increase the coupling interval. Then you decrease the coupling interval by 10 milliseconds until you lose capture, and then you can, and then usually it's at less than 300 milliseconds for the premature um, beat to come in. That's going to result in a change in the QRS morphology. And typically, um, the, the ERP of the his Purkinje system is longer than the um, ERP of the myocardium, so you're going to find a myocardial response. And then the other way to perform this maneuver is, as well as to just introduce premature beats during a native or intrinsic rhythm. And this is more likely to result in, in um, evidence of a selective left bundle branch capture. So just for sake of time, again, I'm just gonna go through this. <clears throat> um, so the interpretation of a deep septal stimulation, there's three possible outcomes. The first is the myocardial ERP is shorter than the left bundle, and that's most often the case. And so what will happen is um, the final, uh, um, capture beat before loss of capture is going to be a pure myocardial capture. 
So it's a wider and slurred beat. Um, the other possibility is this possibility where the myocardial ERP is longer than the left funnel branch ERP, but that's less often the case. But in that situation, you would see a very selective left funnel branch capture. And then it's less common, I mentioned, because the left funnel branch uh, ERP is usually longer than the myocardial ERP. So um, at this moment, you can just deliver extra premature beats. And this will shorten the refractoriness of the left bundle branch, for example, here, and not the myocardium, because the myocardium typically needs several cycles for um, it to shorten its refractoriness. So the second premature beat is actually the selective beat here, um, which there's a little bit of a latent period and a nice right bundle look to it. So that's a selective response. And then, of course, you can have a, a non-diagnostic response where you just get progressive QRS prolongation. There's only minor amplitude changes. Um, and then uh, that typically occurs during a relative refractory period right before ERP. And so here's, again, an extra stim that's given um, during native, so intrinsic rhythm, if, if you're lucky to have intrinsic rhythm. And so a premature stimulus is given, um, and you have a little bit longer time for left bundle branch to recover from the left bundle branch potential to the stim than you do have for the myocardium to actually recover. And so you end up with a selective left bundle branch um, look. And again, similar, this is what the myocardial versus a selective will look like. So the myocardial uh, is here. And so it's a little bit broader looking. Um, typically, you lose your uh, right bundle look. You get a, a, a like a left bundle look, um, and uh, you lose the pointiness of the of the R wave. Whereas uh, in a selective, so this is a non-selective, let's say, so non-selective meaning myocardial plus left bundle branch selective. Um, so as compared to a non-selective, the selective it's going to be a lot you know, more narrow, you're gonna see that latent period and, uh, and a little bit more pointy as well. So again, just again, cause this enough the time, I might not go into this, but uh, the myocardial only capture can be quite subtle itself. So it might not be a very wide and ugly looking uh, QRS, but it could just be that you lose your R wave in V1 and that it's a little bit more slurred than normal. <clears throat> And alternatively, you can just, um, if you know, if your nurses are kind of getting angry at you that you're taking too much time, at, at the end of the procedure, you know, you can just do VOO pacing, you know, like 45, and so have the have the the stim kind of occur at any moment. And sometimes you'll be lucky to find a beautiful coupling interval that only selectively paces um, the left bundle. So, for example, this coupling interval here ended up with a, a very nice. Um, a very nice uh, QRS morphology, a right bundle look, very peaked um, uh, R waves, so suggesting that it was uh, selective um, left bundle pacing only. And then there's differential output maneuver where you dial down the threshold. So here's five volts and you're dialing it down to, I guess, one volt. And typically you can see a nice right bundle branch morphology come out at lower thresholds. Um, this is not common. It's about 20 to 25 percent of the cases that you can see this and typically you're not going to find this response the following day. So, um, but it's still part of the criteria. And then this is very cool, uh, you know, when you're screwing in and you kind of see a flurry of uh, premature beats coming in, they're called screw beats. It's typically an indication to stop screwing, otherwise you're probably going to end up in the uh, left ventricle. But for example, here's a beautiful uh, uh, left bundle, um, selective left bundle um, beat uh, that suggests that you're in the right spot, so you should probably stop there. So, um, okay, I'm going to, this is the kind of the final slide I had before we started to talk about uh, some cases. So, Jackie, Jeff, are you, you there? Sorry? Jackie, can you just go back a couple of slides sure. for just a moment? Um, and I'm here. Okay, yeah, great. so uh, one more ahead. One more ahead, this one. Yeah, exactly. So um, the, the differential output maneuver dialing down the threshold is probably the easiest way to do this. I mean, Jackie was showing you some very elegant maneuvers that you can do with PVCs and coupling intervals. 
Um, but if you're not a very uh, smart electrophysiologist like myself, um, you know, this maneuver here is a lot easier to do. You just basically come down and you're looking for, as you dial down the threshold, uh, look for that uh, non-selective to selective capture change that you would see both in your 12 lead morphology as well as the local electrogram from the tip of your lead. Your electrogram will often shift from an electrogram where it begins right at the stim artifact and then as you dial down the electrogram will suddenly jump away from the stim artifact indicating that there is that latency and that you're now selectively capturing the left bundle. So that is a maneuver that we more often do in our lab, but the, the PVC techniques or the extra stimulus techniques that Jackie uh, was showing you are by far the more elegant uh, ways of, of demonstrating this. And just to answer, I think Andrew Cron made a comment that, you know, this would be very difficult to do outside the EP lab. Um, you're absolutely right, 100%. Uh, so when we do these implants, we are in a room that is equipped with a Pruka recording system. So we do have the 12 leads on a Pruka. We have the local electrogram on the Pruka. So uh, this is very much designed to be an EP lab based uh, technique and would be difficult to do outside of that environment. Although Klaus, uh, I know that, uh, do you have a recording system in your implant room? Uh, absolutely not, no, so we, we just do 10,000 electric cardiograms. <laughs> okay, so yes, yeah, so uh, you're, you're... I, I, yeah, so I mean, we just, I mean, for instance, and we kind of keep it simple, I just do a five volt ECG, like when I think I'm there, and then I do, I find the threshold and I go 0 0.1 volt above and I do another ECG and then you will often in the, on that ECG see the selective, you know, you'll see the, the latency. So it can be simplified to some degree. Yeah, it's Andrew, just, just to clarify, um, you know, I think what it means is you can't do this with portable fluoro in the OR, you know, you need to be in a suite that at least has proper ECG recording because you might notice when you go to the OR sometimes they don't even have proper ECGs. So when you say, what does V1 look like? And they, they've got like lead two showing on the anesthesia cart or something. Um, yeah, yeah. Just for clarity, a tool, just so that I, I thought I heard you say when you lower the threshold, you're, I, did, did you mean or did I hear that you're actually lowering the output, right? Not the threshold? Sorry, you're lowering the output. Yes. Just yeah. Clear. Thanks. Okay, um, so I guess I'm up. Um, so I'm by no means any expert at this, but I just make the point, it's great that so many people are on the call here because I think in the wind up to a study of left bundle pacing, it's a lot like CRT days uh, 15, 20 years ago, or even Casper days, eh, Andrew, that uh, we can learn so much from each other as we go through the initial experience. So really good on you, uh, Jackie, and the tool for putting this on. Uh, so here's a case, uh, this is a patient with intermittent complete heart block, left bundle branch block, first degree AV block at baseline shown here, and they are a patient who's come for uh, TAVR. Um, so maybe flip the slide. Now, left is our AP image of where we put the lead. Uh, there's a few interesting things uh, to discuss here. First of all, I think it was this case, uh, the first lead position actually landed right on the HIS bundle. And uh, I guess to throw it out to uh, the experts, the tool, Jackie, uh, you know, I, I also believe that the left bundle is the better place. If you have a perfect his bundle with your first position, you know, 1.5 volt threshold, five, six volt R wave, do you leave it or do you pull it out and go for an LBBB? There's, a, there's a, such a high chance of, of um you know, requiring constant pacing, you're probably going to need to put in a right ventricular backup lead, I would say, in that situation. And just so much easier to do left bundle branch pacing here, too. The patient, you know, this patient has an aortic valve, so, you know, they might end up with atrial fibrillation later because of LVH and so forth, and uh, probably older. So, you, you know, you can consider eventually doing an AV node ablation in this patient. So you're going to really want nice pacing thresholds. 
and a good, um, reliable lead, I would say. So, yeah. Yeah, so that was our approach. We, we, sorry, so go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I don't know that I've ever just landed on the hiss so nicely before, uh, Jeff, but uh, I would sort of opt to go lower down. Yeah, so that's what we did. And we also did this. This is the final image. Um, we also do this for these left bundle cases, especially Taver cases. We use the, I mean, like some people do, we put the atrial lead in the, uh, in the right ventricle at the start then position our uh, left bundle lead, and then we bring the, the uh, RA lead back up where it belongs in the right atrial appendage. Uh, so again, curious if you do that or if that's redundant or uh, what your thoughts are on that. No, it's a very good point. I mean, if you, uh, you know, during left bundle pacing lead implantation, you're pacing, then you're stopping pacing, you're pacing, you're stopping pacing. So if your patient is in complete heart block with an escape in the 20s or 30s to begin with, and you start pacing them, uh, they may like that pacing. And then when you try to come off, they may have no underlying rhythm anymore. So uh, those are the cases where exactly as you said, Jeff, you can use the atrial lead as a kind of temporary wire in the RV so that when you're pacing and then stop pacing and pacing and stop pacing, you don't have to worry about asystole or uh, you know, lack of ventricular response. Okay, thanks. Uh, so the, the other piece of this that I thought was you know, worthy of sharing because it, it just kind of stunned me a little bit, it's just the image uh, and the relationship between the lead tip and the uh, valve implantation. Uh, now understanding that the valves are not uh, exactly where the native valves are, of course, but the, you know, this patient has a septum that's 1.6 centimeters thick. And uh, when we were screwing it in, it was like, wow, we really have to go deep on this one. And, you know, so the, when you look at the AP here, and maybe we can flip it to the next slide, I think the LEO, uh, you say, okay, this is, this is uh, quite a piece in. Uh, but as the tool said, it's, you know, the, I don't show the septogram, but it's, uh, you know, the uh, proximal uh, ring is fully, fully in and then in a little bit. And then the question is, you know, um, uh, is that far, uh, is that too far? So we were screwing this in. We just couldn't get the R prime in V1. We screw another couple half turns, no R prime, keep screwing another couple turns. The impedance is rock steady, doesn't budge at all. And then finally, when we were just about, you know, when I had reached the end of my nerve, all of a sudden we get, uh, some nice, uh, a nice R prime, and I'll, I'll show it on the next uh, slide. Uh, here we go. So uh, decent looking, at least in my opinion, uh, decent looking um, uh, pace QRS, uh, LVAT and all. And uh, again, it was just a matter of this really set me back and said, wow, that was really a long way in. And, you know, do we consider uh, left ventricular thickness or septal thickness uh, on the pre-op echo? Should that be something we look at routinely going in? Uh, and then understanding the anatomy uh, of the uh, of the taver in this case, how the aorta unfolds, and vis-a-vis uh, -vis where the lead is, and, and the appearance it can have. So, again, I just throw it to the group to uh, if other people have experience or not, or what they think of this case. So, I just want people to memorize this 12 lead ECG because it's really a great example, Jeff. Um, you know, look at AVR and AVL there they are completely dissociated, right? So one is negative, the other is positive. Look at that beautiful QR pattern, or if you want to call that little initial deflection an R wave, then you could call this an R, uh, SR prime, but I, I would sort of call that a QR pattern. Look at the latency between the stim artifact and the beginning of the QRS. You see that especially nicely in AVF there. So you have latency um, and, and you know, you're getting a QRS duration of 127 milliseconds and you might say, well, that doesn't sound so good, but you know, I'm willing to bet Jeff that this guy had quite a pre-existing bundle branch block with his aortic stenosis and aortic valve disease. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was, it was quite wide. I, I can't remember the number. It's on the first panel, Jackie, but uh, uh, but, uh, but that's uh, cool yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, look how ugly that QRS 
Um, you know, that was 162 milliseconds and you're probably even under measuring it there. It's probably more like 170 milliseconds. And then flip to that other ECG, Jeff, your post result. Yeah, look at that. I mean, um, you know, you've knocked about, you know, 50 milliseconds off of that QRS duration. It's, it's really nice. Well, I mean, that might be the first time in 20 years that Atula said something nice on an open mic. So uh, <laughs> this is being recorded, I'd like a copy for a future debate. This is being recorded, and that's the only reason why I'm saying something nice, <laughs> Jeff. So, ja Jackie, let me go back to the last image. So what do people think of this, uh, the, the LEO here? I mean, again, that's what it looks like. Um, it's, it's, you know working well there's no uh there's no change in impedance the lead's pacing fine it just you know it just looks funny right to see the thing going quote unquote halfway under the valve but of course uh, i think jackie's put the uh, uh images in here to match and uh just again if you know we don't usually see the uh, aorta because uh for lack of a tavern but i just thought it was an interesting thing that i could share and then people could see that yeah that's that's how it could look or to anybody have any prior experience like this? No, it can often look like this. And you're absolutely right, Jeff. We often don't have the chance of seeing the valve like you can see it so well here. Um, but, you know, as I was mentioning before, having your lead buried, you know, 1.6 to 2 centimeters in the septum is not unusual. On that, uh, it's Vidal here. Um, it, it sounds like sometimes you have the lead buried a greater distance than you'd expect the septal thickness uh, to be. And I think that, I wonder if that may relate that to the fact that we're probably not always or maybe rarely perfectly perpendicular to the septum. So, you know, Pythagoras theorem will say if you're going in at an angle, the time, it, you know, the distance traveled to get to the other side is going to be uh, significantly longer depending on what that angle is. Um, so, it, you know, Maybe that you're getting a, a longer distance just because you're you're not fully perpendicular in the way you'd measure the septal thickness on an echo or something. Absolutely, it it can be very hard to be perfectly perpendicular sometimes. So that's exactly right. And I wouldn't have been so nerdy as to bring up Pythagoras's uh, rhythm. Uh, sorry, uh, Pythagoras's theorem there, uh, Vidal. But uh, you know, to each their own. That's a good point, too. It just also depends on the anatomical variations between patients. You know, it could be a very small, thicker heart, and so you could find everything's kind of pushed together. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I find that with the tavers, it's a nice example just to see, uh, you know, where you should actually place your lead. So it's actually one of the cases where if you're just starting out, it might be, you know, worth doing a case like this like a post taver patient sometimes you know you end up kind of down here or even further even down here depending on where the sheath takes you and you think you can get just a beautiful result down here than you can up here as well so thanks jeff um i just wanted to show Ask you this question, yeah jack go for it. yeah it's, it's a pragmatic question as a total luddite i'm quite intrigued by this area and, and looking looking at the literature i think it's got a lots of uh, promise from the descriptive and you know, modest size series basis. Um, the question is, it, it's a pragmatic question about, you know, is, is the thing, and I spent today with Larry and Larry uh, taught, taught me a bunch of things about this, which was fantastic. And um, it's a train the trainer thing where Larry taught it to, was uh, learned from a tool and now I'm learning from Larry and so on. So it's quite rewarding to see the dissemination of this. My question is, is there, is there a logical resource for, for novice implanters that's kind of stepwise that walks through this is, uh, you know, a tool, are you willing to share slides? Do we have a process in mind around the um, proctoring and mentoring and resource part of things? In part because um, the, uh, you know, the vendor says this is really off label. And so there isn't a natural system for, uh, you know, the vendor enabling a training process. So curious about comments about that. Yeah, so, um Jackie, I don't know if you uh, have uh, this in the slides, but I do have a distilled one-page summary 
of a step-by-step -step how to do left bundle pacing that we hung up in our EP lab. Uh, because, you know, initially I learned and then my colleagues wanted to learn and so, and the nurses wanted to learn. So I, I just brought it down to the simplest basic, here are the seven steps you need to follow with all of the different criteria. So I'm happy to share that. And, uh, you know, um, in terms of this uh, uh, Zoom, we are recording it so that people can um, go back to this and reference this and, and you can look at the slides. Um, I'll need to ask Santosh, uh, Andrew, about, you know, uh, those, those are not my slides, as I mentioned, they're Santosh's slides. I'm sure he won't have an issue with them. Um, but we do plan on creating a resource so that people can translate this into their own centers. Thank you. Um, I don't know, it's, it's eight o'clock, it's after eight o'clock, so if any of, any of you wanna um, have to go, you know, go for it. But I think, you know, I think we'll just finish off. Klaus, are you, are you there still? Yes, I am, yeah. Great, um, maybe we can kind of go through, you give me a few uh, beautiful ECGs. <laughs> I, I love win. this Tron theme, man, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is just a case from last week and, and just uh, sort of really this one's a little bit more sort of common things that you see. So this is somebody with intermittent high grade AV block with a, a, with a uh, left bundle. Uh, I forget exactly what I sent you, but just show me the next one. Sure. Did you put an atrial? Did you put the atrial lead in the apex here? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah. And, and when you when you put it in, do you screw it in or do you just leave it kind of sitting there? I screw it in. I I just put it very inferiorly on the septum and I, I screw it in because I, I don't want to have any surprises. So um, I, I did that last week and unfortunately my atrial, and then I repositioned my atrial lead up. It was a patient with a prior mitral valve um, replacement and then fortunately the atrial lead dropped in the next day. So I had to go back, but you have to be very careful, you know, about sometimes maybe ensuring that your atrial lead is really going to capture well after that or stick well. Sorry. Well, you're go ahead. Because there might be some debris. I, I, um, now, um, not actually sure, just to go to the next uh, slide, I'm, I'm wondering exactly. Yeah, so this is just as I'm, if you go back, this is as we're advancing the screw. So um, you can already see that if you measure it exactly, the LVAT's probably shorter. Then uh, the next one, suddenly we are start, starting to get a little bit of an R prime uh, in it. And the LVAT gets, very short uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then if you go one further yeah then you'll notice the bipolar when you're pacing bipolar is a common thing because I, I that the r prime goes away because of i assume because of so there it is unipolar that's bipolar uh and you can see it come and go i think be, probably because of intermittent uh, anodal capture, I think, uh, anodal stim. So uh, when it's unipolar, it's always an R prime. When you do it bipolar at high outputs, it the R prime goes away and at lower outputs, uh, you'll see the, uh, the like this, the R prime disappears. The, uh, the, the rest of the ECG stays the same, but uh, so those, you know, I, I, that's, very common and at first I kind of was put off by that. I'd hook up the pacemaker, which is bipolar, and suddenly there'd be no R prime anymore. And, and so it's it's not a problem. It's it's what you yeah, see. Yeah, th that's a really excellent point, Klaus. Um, so, you know, there there are a few things. I mean, first of all, even though you've lost your R prime here, it's still a very nice result. It's a beautiful result. But if sometimes what will happen is when you lose that R prime, when you go to bipolar because of that anodal stim, your QRS will actually get wider and you're no longer selectively engaging the left bundle. You're now sort of also non-selectively engaging some of the myocardium. So a few of the things or tricks or strategies that you can use for this is that 
the first thing is you could actually just program the pacing as unipolar, but program the sensing as bipolar. So, um, you know, now with pacemakers, it doesn't have to be one or the other. Uh, you can do the pacing unipolar, but sensing bipolar to avoid some of the, the, the noise or Maya potentials that you might pick up with unipolar sensing. Another strategy is, um, you know, as you mentioned, as you lower the output on the lead, you will notice that you get more of that R prime because you have less of that anodal stim. But so, I found the QR restoration doesn't really change. It's it, the morphology changes, but the total time to activate the entire heart stays the same. I, I, so uh, I'm not sure so, if it's a disadvantage. This is the famous like selective versus non-selective space. I mean, something yeah. else is happening, but it, does it matter? Sometimes the QRS does balloon out. So, uh, you know, not always, as you've pointed out, but sometimes it does. And so, yeah. so the other strategy is, you know, with left bundle area pacing, you often get a threshold less than one. So even if you want to maintain a two times safety margin, you can program the output at two or two and a half instead of doing the out of the box setting of three and a half. And you might get your nice R prime. And then the third strategy is if you have not yet hooked up the pacemaker, um, Santosh always used to joke with me. He would always, I would always say, have I turned enough? And he would always say one more turn, just one more turn. And so if you were to turn just one more time here, you might really embed that helix completely in the left bundle and even get that proximal electrode closer to it such that you get more selective pacing even in the bipolar mode. So those are the three strategies. Lower the, the, the output so that you still have two times safety margin, pace unipolar, or uh, screw one or two more times if you can. Um, saying, but to your but to your I point, in this case, yeah. the QRS didn't, didn't change. So yeah, I I, I didn't. You're right. I look. You look at both, but it didn't change particularly. The uh, then I I just had one of this. This is one other case, and and, and I wanted to. Uh, it was more a question. So this is somebody with epicardial pacing with third degree heart block with a narrow QRS escape. And you'll notice with the epicardial pacing, AVR and AVL are, are discordant. So then I put my lead in and I got the uh, next uh, slide. They're completely concordant. And I moved it around and it, concordance was seen in a wide area of the septum. And so I just said, all right, well, I'll see what happens. And I screwed it in and this is what I got, which is the next one which is this, this is the same lead position as the previous one, same concordant AVR and AVL with this odd looking tall R wave in V1. Uh, and I had really no, uh, I, I put this up because I'm not sure what exactly I'm pacing here. I didn't accept this by the way, I, cause I was confused, but I threw it up here because I don't know what that is. I don't know if anybody has any ideas. Well, the the only thing I'll let Jackie, she probably could answer this better than me, but um, you know, seeing that AVL and AVR are completely concordant, that, that means you're certainly higher up on the septum and probably mm -hmm. closer to a more traditional hiss position than you are in a left bundle area um, position. This is definitely distal to the hiss because I, 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 uh, I did map uh, where, uh, you know, so it, it is distal. I mean, and the interesting thing is when I moved it proximally and inferiorly, your point is well taken, uh, the, the, the next ECG came up. Uh, okay. There I yeah. now have a tiny initial negative. So I, the initial, there is initial discordance. Yes. And uh, and a notch. So this is proximal and inferior. And then the next ECG is as you drive it in, 
you come with it. Yeah, you know. there we go. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. This this here, you know, also, you know, what you're seeing is not just a discordance here, but lead two on the septum is usually has a um, more um, of an R wave than lead three. Lead three is not always negative. It just might be more negative than lead two. And so that's also a nice, um, yeah. you know, place. Um, where you are here, and that next one is really beautiful. You really see that nice latent period. It's incredible. Actually, well, it's really nice. The see next it. one, I just did it at two voltages. As you, oh, sorry, this is bipolar showing again that that R <laughs> wave goes away. I don't know if the QRS is wider. Uh, uh, pretty close. And then the next one is. Uh, so this is 0.5 volts. Yeah. Where you really see a very, very clear iso, you know, uh, I think selective left funnel pacing. And the next one's five volts where you lose that. So, so this can be done in the OR, just took it up to a regular 12 lead. And as long as you're willing to spend a long time pushing buttons and uh, printing out ECGs, it, it can be done without, you know, with just fluoro. Uh, It's a very nice example. Thanks, Klaus. Um, but you know, this is this is the great thing about left bundle pacing is you know usually, you know, it's amazing that at the lower outputs you get more selective left bundle capture, and you know with his bundle pacing it's often the opposite. You know, you have to go at a much higher output. So it's interesting. Actually, it's Yeah, if you hit the left bundle, it's actually about 50-50. I mean, sometimes, often you do lose the myocardium first and you get selective and sometimes the other way around. It's But I've never seen, I haven't done as nearly as many cases as you guys, but I have never seen, I, I don't know, don't understand this. As you go down, why do you not sometimes lose the left bundle and have just pure myocardial capture? I've never, I haven't seen that at all, which is in his, that's what you, you know, you will not uncommonly see that you lose the, you lose the hiss, you get essentially RV pacing. And yet it doesn't seem to occur with left bundle pacing. Well, it is usually in the bipolar mode. So, you know, it's just the loss of anodal stim, you know, as you go down to the lower outputs it's less obvious in the unipolar compared to the bipolar. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just a very, uh, you know, the elegance of this and, and the low thresholds and the lead, uh, you know, the sensing is often great as well. Like you just don't run into the same problems as you do with his bundle pacing. No, and I told you and I, you know, we argued about this, a little, or at least I argued. You had you had no question in your argument, but uh, uh, I, yeah, I, I think his bundle pacing is ha having done a fair bit of it. It is just it is really too difficult and time consuming to apply to you know large numbers of individuals. Um. Okay, I think uh, there's some chat, um, but uh, I think maybe we should conclude here for the first session. Um, so uh, any final thoughts at all or any, I'll make sure that, you know, we could send out the uh, one pager, you know, I'll make a, you know, I can send it out to everybody and uh, so they can get going. I mean, you haven't started, you know, don't uh, get so frustrated after the, if the first few don't kind of work. Um, I was talking to a tool last week and we were I was mentioning how I had a horrible case and then the, the next case was just so great. So it just kind of motivates you to keep trying and keep going and uh, so. Yeah, you are gonna run into some difficult cases, especially when the RV is really large or when you have very diffuse conduction system disease and you know that septum is going to be horribly fibrotic. Um, those are going to be the cases that you're going to swear up and down that you never want to do this again. And then it just takes one narrow QRS that looks like Klaus's case or Jeff's case and then you're addicted for life uh, and you never want to go back. So it's uh, it's very much. I guess if I could summarize, it's it's very much like crack cocaine. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the key is to to start with something straightforward. You know, I mean, normal EF, uh, not tons of hypertrophy, not not like we did recently, which didn't work. Was a sarcoid patient. You know, that was an utter loser. But yeah. Um, just one last question: In patients with left bundle branch block, can left bundle branch potentials be recorded without restoration of left bundle conduction? Because if, you, if the left bundle potential should, this question, by the way, from Toronto. Hi, Arthur. Yeah. Great presentation. Hi. Um, the, typically, the description is that you can record a left bundle potential only if the patient has got a non left bundle branch block to begin with, right? If there's left bundle branch block, you'll have to first face the hiss and overcome left bundle conduction. So that only then can you record left, uh, left bundle potential, isn't it? I mean, that's the teaching. Yeah, so it's a good point, Chris. Uh, you know, I think there's, um, you know, what Santosh told me is there's left bundle branch block and then there's left bundle branch block. So, you know, uh, you can have a complete left bundle branch block or you can have obviously an incomplete and then there's a gray zone in between where you have varying degrees of conduction along the left bundle system, even though your ECG shows a left bundle branch block pattern. And so um, you're absolutely right. If you have a complete left bundle branch block and it's, uh, you know, especially if it's more proximal in the left bundle system, then it can be very hard to record such a potential. Whereas, you know, if it's uh, not as complete, if it's in that gray zone and it's more distal in the system, then, you know, it may not be, it may be quite possible for you to record the potential. Um, but Jackie, you're the one who makes up the potentials. So, you know, what do you think about that? Gain up, you'll see it. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, but in seriousness, I mean, it's true. Maybe, maybe that's one of the reasons why we're not seeing the left bundle potential because it's not actually there. So, um, I don't know, lots to learn, I think, still um, from this. And I don't think we have all the answers either. So, great. Okay, so uh, I guess we'll do another kind of the next session, um, maybe in later in November. Uh, probably we'll talk a little bit more about cases and kind of um, more specific uh, questions. And if anybody has any, you know, cases that they want to bring up or um, present, uh, that would be a fantastic opportunity to, I think, and just keep going um, and keep learning as we go. And, and by the way, Santosh Padala has, has agreed to, you know, attend some of these. So, um, you know, we, we may hold, dangle that out there to all of you as a way of attracting you to a next webinar that maybe we'll, we'll roll out the big guns. Great. Okay, thanks everybody. I'll see you next time. Have a nice night and thanks for, for joining. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Thanks.